Howdy, Internet. My name is Doug Parker, and I'm the devil without a cause. Uh, I'm here today with a quick update video on hydroactive. I'm going to be talking about hydration, what exactly that term means, what problems you run into when you try to hydrate, as well as how hydroactive can help solve those problems. I mean, hydration is half of the name after all, so it seems like a pretty important concept for hydroactive for me to be talking about. Before we get into the main content of the video, I want to start with a new recurring segment called Changelog. Uh, this is where I walk through recent updates to Hydroactive that don't necessarily directly relate to the main topic of the video. Uh, in this case, there's one primary change I've made that was intended partially to support hydration, but also just completely changes how things work in Hydroactive since the last video. I want to spend some time breaking down exactly what that is and why I made those changes. In the previous video, I showed comp.live, which is a really powerful API. It queries for the provided selector, asserts that something was found, deserializes the contents, initializes a signal from those contents, binds that signal for future updates to the DOM, and then returns it. And that's really useful, but there's also just a lot of complexity for a single function. And as I started looking into hydration support, I found this to be a bit too complicated to really be usable. I found myself wanting to make live much more configurable, and so I did the natural thing and just kind of started adding a bunch of options to it. Uh, I had an option not to throw an error if the selector wasn't found. I had an option to be able to bind to just an attribute instead of text contents, which is sometimes useful. Uh, I had an option to be able to get a reference to the DOM element directly instead of deserializing anything at all. Um, but even then, I still needed a way to be able to like bind multiple elements in an array, which is sometimes useful. And then also I needed to figure out how to actually hydrate those elements, which is the motivation for this video. And then I needed to repeat all of this for comp.bind, and it just kind of, it was clearly becoming a mess, it's just too much stuff going into it. Essentially, I was designing an API which is just slowly growing in complexity, right? I had this optional true flag for the not found issue. Um, I had a live attribute function, which was just for binding to attributes. I had a separate live all function that would do an array, give you back an array of signals. Uh, then I needed to repeat all of this for dot .bind, uh, because again, that's the same thing. Not to mention that occasionally you need to use multiple of these things together. So you've got this like matrix overlap of all these different features. And so I found myself with a live all attributes and you know, you can also support optionals and other serializers and it's just clearly the wrong approach here. And the main lesson is just that comp.live was simply doing too much and you can't easily break it down and compose it or configure it in a useful way. So my main goal here is to try to break things up a little bit and give you some more useful primitives that do these things a little bit more discreetly for what you're trying to accomplish. So instead, I broke Live up into its primitive pieces of functionality. And I've identified a three-step process for adding interactivity to your site with Hydroactive. Step one, query it. Step two, hydrate it. Step three, enhance it. Now, let's take a look at how we can use this process to get the same effects just as easily as comp.live, but with much more flexibility. So let's break down the new API structure for interacting with hydroactive components. So firstly, we've still got defined component that still works exactly the same way as it did before, but you'll now notice I've added this host parameter. And this is a reference to the host element that actually owns this component, uh, and it's sort of wrapped in an API to make it a little bit more ergonomic to work with uh, and a little bit easier to manage. Now in the callback, we, these APIs look a little bit different because we're using host instead of comp. Uh, inside here, we're now going to use this, this three-step process that I talked about. Uh, the first step is going to be host.query. That's the first thing that's actually executing in this line. Right? We're actually querying the element, finding the thing that we want and getting it back. The second step is hydrating it, or in this case, really not hydrating it. Um, that's what dot .access does. Dot .access says, actually, this is a span tag. It doesn't need to be hydrated, so let's just not worry about that. Um, this manages the types in, in a reasonable way, and it actually asserts that the value is, in fact, something that doesn't need to be hydrated. Um, so you're getting reasonable protections here, but in this case, you're basically saying you don't need to hydrate it, and we're just sort of explicitly stating that. Finally, you get to the enhance step, which is where live comes in. And live is now a separate function that you pull into here, but with this, we can now grab, yeah, this is a hydrated element. Live knows what to do with that. Um, we're passing through comp and then specifying a string of saying that this is just a string element. Um, interpret the text content as a string. That's all it needs to do. Uh, and live does the right thing to bind the signal, which is really the main thing that it connects to. So I get back a signal. And then I can either read or set that signal to this value. So if I look at the actual running page, um, it's, it says hello world and it kind of flickers because immediately on page load, it just writes over with uh, hydroactive. So this is kind of the new structure for being able to define this. Again, you know, the really the important thing is about this three-step process of first one is querying it, then you decide how you're going to hydrate it, uh, then you're going to actually enhance it with the behavior that you really want. Um, 
that's how we're, we're just sort of building on top of these. What's nice about this is that it allows you to break down some of this functionality. So for example, I talked about what if the element isn't there? Sometimes you're okay with that. You don't want it to throw an error. So in that case, you could say host.query span, and this query has the ability for optional. So you could say optional true. And now I get, uh, you know, maybe a span is what I got from here. And that's going to be uh, an or null on that. You have to deal with that or null, right? Because it might not be there. But uh, live doesn't accept a null, so you're gonna have to deal with that at some point. Um, and so this means that live doesn't need to deal with this functionality. It's part of the, the act of querying is deciding whether or not you're okay with the element not being there and how you're gonna manage that. Um, similarly, if I wanted to do, uh, if I wanted live all, for example, and actually iterate over an array of elements, um, what I can do is I can do host.query all. So query is really the thing that, that uh, cares about whether or not you've got multiple things. So I can query for, let's say, all the headers. And then for each one, I'm gonna map. I've got a header on here, and then I can say header.access, because I need to do step two of whether or not I need to hydrate it. And then uh, let's make a live binding of this with comp string. And now I've got all my headers. And so this is an array of signals. And that's a lot more easy to work with. I don't need a separate live. All live doesn't need to understand all those different flavors. It's just a matter of query, dealing with the result of that, uh, and then passing that on to the hydration and enhancing steps. So this is where how we're kind of using this functionality to make something that is decomposable while still making it really easy to use live uh, in the same way. And that's sort of like more powerful functionality is still really straightforward to use, but also something that could be broken down into smaller pieces when you need to tweak that behavior. So I'm really happy with this. I think this is a, a much more ergonomic way to do things. I'm still working through some of the specifics. Um, I'm not sure about the best way to, to deal with comp at this point. Comp is still kind of necessary because that gives you lifecycle methods, uh, specifically as comp.connected which live does need is why that needs to be passed into the reference. Still debating how to handle that. Uh, maybe I'll add it onto host or deal with something else there, but I think this is a, a reasonable path forward and I do like the idea of being able to separate out some of this functionality and, and make things more composable that way. So with that out of the way, let's dive into the main content of this video, which is hydration. What exactly does that mean and what does hydration represent? Well, the web community is kind of inconsistent with the definition of hydration, so I'm just gonna go with the Wikipedia definition as, as a baseline and maybe make my seventh grade history teacher roll over in his grave. But Wikipedia states that hydration is a technique in which client-side JavaScript converts a static HTML web page into a dynamic web page by attaching event listeners to the HTML elements. Now that's a definition, I guess. Uh, but it seems a little bit constraining, and it mostly boils down to the process of adding event listeners, which I think is a little reductive based on my interpretation of the term. So instead, I'd like to propose my own definition. I'm going to say that hydration is a technique in which client-side JavaScript reconciles state with or adds interactivity to pre-rendered HTML content. Now, for definitions like this, I think it's really important for the language to be both very precise and also minimal, with every word being critically load-bearing and having just no extra fluff whatsoever. So let's break down exactly what each part of this definition means and how that works out in practice. When I say client-side JavaScript, really what I mean is that hydration is a process which must occur on the client. Essentially, what I'm really just saying is that hydration happens here on the client. Reconcile state with means the JavaScript and the HTML may have different knowledge of, and different understanding of the application state. This knowledge needs to be reconciled so that they both agree on the full state of the world. This can mean that the JavaScript sort of learns about the content in the pre-rendered HTML. For example, we can learn that the initial count is five and initialize a JS variable for reference later. It can also go the other way where client-side state in JavaScript is inserted into the HTML. Take this example where the username actually is not known to the server and is only tracked on the client in local storage. Therefore, any kind of pre-rendering can't know what the user's name is and can't insert it into the document. Instead, it leaves a placeholder which gets overwritten during hydration based on the knowledge available to the client JavaScript. Note that I am taking a pretty expansive view of state here. Uh, this could be logical application state. It could be getting a JavaScript reference to a DOM element that we're gonna use in the future. It could just be reading content from some client-side data store like local storage or IndexedDB, or even maybe accessing device metadata like the current operating system or the exact viewport position. The point is that the JavaScript and the pre-rendered HTML have incomplete views on the state of the world, and hydration is necessary as a process to join those two views together into one that has the complete set of information. Moving on, we get to adds interactivity to. 
which is my way of saying that hydration applies behavior to the pre-rendered HTML. This can be a one-off interaction, like just enabling a button and stopping there, but it can also mean binding an event listener such that when you click that button, it will increment the count displayed next to it. So sort of like the Wikipedia definition states, binding event listeners is probably the most common interaction pattern in hydration. But it's by no means the only one. I'm also taking a pretty expansive view of what interactivity means as well. Uh, for example, hydration might not do anything immediately, but instead it would expose some functionality for other JavaScript code to leverage. Uh, in this case, we export an increment function which will read write to the DOM lazily. So it doesn't necessarily require an initialization step during hydration, but hydration can simply be the act of exposing this function and being in a state where you can guarantee that it's going to work as expected. So we can be a little flexible with exactly what interactivity means as well. One more important piece of the definition is pre-rendered HTML. This implies that whatever HTML you're hydrating was already rendered somewhere else. Hydration is able to take this HTML and DOM as an input to the process, reconcile that state, and add interactivity. If you render DOM from scratch on the client and then add interactivity to it, that's not really hydration. You're just client-side rendering new content. So really, you can think of it like, it's only hydration if it comes from the pre-rendered region of HTML. Otherwise, it's just sparkling client-side rendering. One final important point is that I use the term HTML content, not HTML document. This is because hydration is not necessarily a full page process. It can be, you can hydrate a full page or application all at once, but this isn't required. You could hydrate just a single component, which is the main thing that Hydroactive cares about, or you could hydrate even just like a single DOM element or maybe even a part of a DOM element. The important part here is that different aspects of the page, different areas of the page are going to hydrate at different times based on what the user is doing and how that page is configured. Now I'll admit, I'm just making up a definition that kind of makes sense to me, but you might disagree. Certainly I imagine others would. And if so, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. How would you define hydration and what are the differences between what you think it means and what I've presented here? So now that we've got the definition out of the way, let's actually dive into what it might look like to write a web component that hydrates and what are some of the problems that you run into when you do that. So let's take a look at this example where I have an outer component, an inner component, and then underneath that, I've got some text that says what the current count is. And I'm loading scripts for both of these components. I want these to be able to hydrate together and work together um, to present a good user experience. Now let's look at inner component first. And now again, I'm not using Hydroactive for this. This is plain web component syntax. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, don't worry too much about it. Um, but essentially what I've done here is I've got a, a plain web component which defines two methods. Uh, the first one is hydrate, which allows you to get references to the, doc, the DOM that it's actually loaded with, figures out what that initial count is and sort of initializes that value. And then it has an increment method, and that allows you to increment the current count and it will update the document with whatever the new count is. So hopefully a relatively straightforward component. The idea is just, oh, it knows what the initial count is and you can increment that value over time. So now let's look at outer component. And in outer component, we've got a connected callback. This is a web components lifecycle API. And that's where uh, this function basically gets invoked uh, whenever this component either gets connected to the document or when it first gets upgraded, when this script first executes. Uh, and in here we say, uh, we grab a reference to the inner element. We just sort of query for the inner component and then we call it increment. So in this case, we're saying when this gets attached to the document, just increment the value once. So on page load, I would expect this to immediately hydrate and increment the current value from five to six. That's what the expected behavior. So let's try that. Let's go over here, refresh the page, and oh, doesn't work. We actually get an error that inner.increment is not a function, uh, which maybe isn't a super descriptive error. So let's see what's going on here, right? We, we look at the actual error up here, and I can break point, reload, look at this, and see, yep, inner.increment is not a function, it's undefined. Uh, inner exists, which is kind of weird, right? And we have a thing, but we somehow don't have an increment function. That's a little weird. And maybe you see the mistake that I've made here, but uh, I can certainly see, uh, even if, even once you understand what this is, I can absolutely see a developer losing an hour or two trying to understand, like, how is inner.increment not a function? Uh, it's it's kind of confusing in that. What's actually happened here is the, the problem actually isn't in this code. The problem is in this set. Uh, what we see here is that outer comp was loaded. We've executed this on the page, but inner comp is not here. The inner component hasn't happened yet. Uh, in fact, we just, we have not initialized the code. We haven't loaded the code to define the inner component yet. And so outer component is trying to use an inner component that doesn't exist yet, that hasn't been defined. So even though the element exists, the elements on the page, it hasn't been upgraded to the inner component element that we've defined. 
So the fix here actually is to just rearrange it. The mistake that I made was that I loaded these scripts out of order. Outer comp loads first, tries to hydrate itself, tries to increment the inner comp, fails, and then inner comp loads afterwards. So really the problem is that I just did these backwards. So the, the easy fix here is to swap these around. Then when we flip back and retry it, we can see that, well, we didn't really fix the problem, but we did change the error message, and that's what's important. Uh, so we've, we've managed to fix one problem, but there's something else going on here. So let's look at cannot set inner properties of undefined. Um, so if we go over here, look at this, we see that the count is failing. Really, it's the text content. It's this dot counter dot text content that's having the problem. If we mouse over here, sure enough, this dot counter is undefined. So in this case, we're in inner component. We got that far at least. Um, and so really the issue is that this dot counter was undefined because it should be set up here in hydrate but I didn't call hydrate. Outer comp just grabs a reference to this thing and just immediately tries to use it without hydrating it. So that's a mistake. I didn't hydrate it correctly. Uh, the fix here is to instead uh, go into outer component and call inner dot hydrate. Then when we try this again, hooray, we now no longer have an error and the count is now six. So we got the expected behavior. It's able to just immediately increment this on page load. So what happened here? What, what exactly went wrong? What were the problems with this? Well, there were two problems here. The first was that the outer component needs to load after inner component, right? Outer component essentially has a dependency on inner component and inner component needs to happen first. So we have this file ordering issue where inner component has to happen first. The second issue is that uh, the outer component, inner component kind of disagreed on what the correct contract is for hydrating a component. Outer component does this immediately uh, in connected callback over here. Uh, it immediately does this in connected callback. So you don't have to think about hydrating it. It just kind of hydrates itself, uh, which is really nice. I don't have to remember to call hydrate on it. But that means that it's always going to happen on page load or when that component is defined and it's going to go immediately and I can't control it. I can't stop it. Meanwhile, the inner component has this little hydrate function. And so that's great in that I have control over it. I can call this whenever I want to, whenever it is an appropriate time to hydrate it. But also I have to remember to do that. And it's very easy to forget, like I did earlier, right? They, they sort of have different contracts for what it means to hydrate and how you trigger that. And that leads to this confusion. So we've essentially got two problems, which we can break down to first one being, what order should these files actually be executed in? And the second one should be, how do you hydrate a given component? Now I'm gonna solve these a little bit out of order and let's tackle the second question first. How do we hydrate? We can answer the question of how to hydrate with the defer hydration community protocol. If you've never heard of it, the Web Components Community Group has a repository called Community Protocols. These protocols are not specs or standards, they're kind of more like standards adjacent. Uh, essentially, they describe any API which browsers don't necessarily need to implement, but rather define a common protocol that Web Components can use to become more interoperable with each other without requiring explicit integrations. For example, we can answer this how to hydrate question by looking at the defer hydration community protocol, which explicitly defines a means for deferring and then triggering hydration. Any components which implement this protocol will then be interoperable with all other components that use that protocol. Even if those two components actually have no knowledge of each other and no shared implementation. So let's see how this works. Normally when a component is defined, it's automatically connected and usually immediately hydrates. This is exactly what that outer component was doing in the previous example. So here that means that we would immediately enable the button and bind the event listener to increment the count. And we do that on page load or at least as soon as the JavaScript loads. However, you can specify defer hydration on the element. When the component is initially upgraded, it first checks whether defer hydration was set. If so, it just does nothing. Upgrading the component is a complete no-op. The attribute has, just as the name suggests, deferred hydration until a later time. Later on, any JavaScript code could get a reference to this element and remove that attribute. When this happens, the component detects that change and immediately triggers hydration. So only now is the component enabled and the event listener bound. This means hydration for any component can be deferred and later triggered at any time. Remember, this is a community protocol, so defer hydration doesn't do anything uh, the browsers don't implement this. There's no functionality here. It's just an attribute. However, it's an attribute with an agreed name and semantics such that any component can implement its associated behavior to allow others to control their hydration. So let's take a look at how HydroActive uses this to control when and how components hydrate. So here I've got a few demos to show you of three different kind of components. First one is just a deferred component and then using two together and then an isLand uh, 
integration I'll show. So let's start with a component here. We've got hello world, and on page low, this doesn't do anything. Nothing happens. And I refresh the page, nothing happens. But when I click hydrate is when this component hydrates, it updates from hello world to hello hydroactive. So this is typical defer, right? It needs to not do anything on page load, and instead, when I click this button, actually trigger hydration. So let's see at how we can make that work. Um, so firstly, the HTML we're looking at right here, we've got deferred comp, is the name of this component, and then I put defer hydration, right? This is the attribute that's doing the magical thing. This is telling hydroactive, do not hydrate on page load, wait until something removes this attribute. Then we've got the, the classic text inside there, loading the script for it. And lastly, I've got this hydrate button, which I've defined here. And I'm using an ancient and arcane method of defining uh, event listeners in a way that was deemed heretical by the content security policy school of security engineering. But uh, you know what? I had fun with it, and isn't that what counts? So in here, we've got this JavaScript event handler, which just finds the previous element and removes defer hydration. So literally all we're doing is getting a reference to this deferred comp, and then just removing the defer hydration attribute. And then lastly, we're just disabling uh, disabling this button because you can't hydrate twice. That wouldn't make sense. And when we do this, this does indeed work, right? The component has no interaction whatsoever up front, and it's only when I click hydrate that suddenly it becomes interactive. So this might, this might be useful for an example, or maybe you have a side panel that's like hidden by default, but then when a user clicks on the side panel and shows it, that's when you would want to hydrate the stuff inside of it because now the, the user is actually going to use it. And how does this work? Well, if we look at the deferred comp implementation, you'll notice that there's actually nothing in here. This is just the literal hello world component. In fact, if I bring up uh, hello world right here and just like put them side by side, uh, you can see that up here we've got this live with the span and set the name, and then down here we have the exact same implementation. <laughs> uh, and so essentially what, what the hydroactive is doing here is that it's just not invoking the callback until hydration time, right? This callback is what happens during hydration, not initialization, not upgrade. And so it's just triggering this at the right moment so that you just implicitly get support for defer hydration. What I think is really cool about this is that I don't need to write this component with defer hydration in mind. I don't need to think that like, well, what do I do for the case where it gets deferred? That just magically gets supported and just magically works in the correct way. Uh, so essentially whether or not to defer a component is a question of how you use that component, not how you define that component. Next, let's look at the second example. Uh, and this one's a little bit more complicated, but please bear with me. Um, essentially, the we've got two components that we're trying to work together. We've got deferred composition, and then we have deferred composition child. And there's actually two instances of this. So deferred composition child contains this like this little text that says devil says hello. Uh, and then also we've got a second one down here, which says Owen says hello, right? So we've got two components that are both saying hello, and then this wrapper that can see both of them. Now, what you'll notice is that the first deferred composition is not deferred, right? I, the name's a little bit misleading, but it's not, it does not have defer hydration, so that will hydrate immediately. Meanwhile, the second one does have defer hydration right here. So that one is not going to hydrate. And we need deferred composition to do the correct thing because it wants to be able to interact with both of these components. Specifically, it has this tag at the bottom, which says the two speakers are named, and then we have the first speaker and the second speaker. Now, I don't want to break composition, so I don't want to just like query down into these uh, these names. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask this first deferred composition child, who's the speaker? Who's saying hello? This would say devil. This one would say Owen. And I'm going to take those two, and I'm going to write them out into here. Um, so it's kind of a, a wonky example, maybe a little bit, but the idea is just let's explore with what, uh, what kind of power we can get uh, and how fine-grained can we get with this hydration functionality. So let's look at how this is actually implemented. So in deferred composition, we've got two main blocks that are sort of loading the different uh, different speaker names. Um, the first one is we're, we're repeating the process that I've talked about before of step one, query, step two, hydrate, step three, enhance. And so we start off with just querying. What is the, the first child in here? Second, we hydrate it. In this case, we're using dot access because it did not have defer hydration on it. We don't need to hydrate it. It already hydrated as part of, uh, as just part of page load. And in doing so, so, we're using dot access, and then we need to pass in the custom element definition. That tells uh, Hydroactive exactly which component you're expecting. It'll type check it correctly for you, and it'll assert that you did, in fact, give the correct uh, custom element definition. Then you get the underlying element, because this is kind of wrapped to uh, make this a little bit more ergonomic. So you get the underlying element, and then you can call a method on that. So I'm going to call get speaker name, which is a method that I've defined on this child element. 
and that gives me the name of the speaker that I found during hydration. So that's sort of step two of like, step two is hydrating, and then step three is where we enhance it, we're getting the speaker name, and then we bind that speaker name to the first speaker element. So that's binding it down to this span tag, or putting it into the page, okay? And that's taking care of the first, the first speaker. Now we do the second one, we do exactly the same thing of query the second one, but instead of access, we call dot hydrate. Dot hydrate's a method that I've set up for you, which automatically is able to do this. Um, again, you pass in the custom element definition, it will query that element, it will hydrate this, um, actually trigger all the process it's doing, so it's essentially removing that defer hydration attribute. It's doing a little bit more than that, is why I would recommend using dot hydrate as opposed to just like dot remove attribute defer hydration. Because is, there is more nuance to this than you might think, and this sort of smooths over some of those uh, edge cases as well. It's just asserting that you're doing the right thing, that the element hasn't already hydrated, and that you've got the right, uh, that the element's actually loaded first. Um, so we're triggering hydration there, and then finally we're getting the speaker name and binding it to the second speaker. So by doing this, we can flip over here, uh, load it, and you'll notice that devil says hello to hydroactive. What that's saying is when I reload, you'll notice it's changing from world to hydroactive. That means that this inner component is actually hydrating immediately, because it didn't have defer hydration, right? So the first component hydrates immediately. Um, second one does not. Second one is deferred, so it continues to say world. The speaker names haven't hydrated yet. But then when I click hydrate and trigger the outer component, that's when the inner component hydrates, it switches to hydroactive, and we're now able to pull Devil and Owen out of this and get the correct names and load those correctly. So by doing this, we're now at a correct space. You can also see in the, the console log here, when I load the first time, it only says it hydrated Devil because that's the first one. And then uh, it's only when I click hydrate that the second one appears and now uh, it says it has hydrated. So by doing this, we're able to sort of orchestrate things in a reasonable way. And what's very cool about this is that without you even noticing, I solved the first problem from earlier, the script ordering. Remember, I had the separate problem of how do, the, how do we get the files to load in the correct order? And we actually solved that here without you even noticing. Uh, what happened here is that if we look at the HTML, uh, the only script tag I loaded was deferred composition. Um, so that's the outer component here. That's this component's definition. And yet when you look in here, this doesn't include the child. What it does include is it imports the child element because that gets referenced either in .access or .hydrate. And this is the reason why I require you to do this. Technically, you wouldn't have to if we actually look into like, what does .hydrate do? Uh, if we look, all it does, it triggers hydrate, it goes through a couple layers of indirection. But then if I look at the element class that you're actually passing in, all we do is do an assertion check. If you gave us the right thing, is all we check for. So we want to throw an error if you get the wrong element, but that's about it. But that's all we do with element class. If you notice, it does not appear anywhere else in this function. Like I said, fundamentally, this is just doing element.remove attribute, but we have some safety checks here to make sure that you're not misusing it. And so uh, what is interesting about this is because we have this sort of dependency on the child element, it actually forces you to import or otherwise load that child first, which means that when you actually execute the script, when you bundle it in any kind of reasonable bundler, uh, that child element will go first and has to be executed first, which means that when we get here, we know that this component will have been defined, it'll be upgraded, uh, and the dot hydrate call knows that it's just triggering hydration, that component's already defined for you. Uh, and it'll sanity check things just to make sure, but the idea is that by doing this, we've implicitly created the correct ordering for these files, and you as a developer didn't need to think about it, you don't need to worry about it, it's a problem that just isn't an issue because Hydroactive magically solved it for you without even really doing anything, but we just structured the API such that uh, it's completely not a problem for you. And I'm, I'm really happy with how that worked out because you wouldn't even notice it in practice, but I think it's a very powerful thing it's just by requiring this one little reference that suddenly solves all your file ordering problems in a way that you wouldn't never think about. The last example I want to talk about is is land. Um, so if we scroll down here to this final one, there's two examples in here. Um, now, uh, is land, or really it's island. I know it's supposed to be island, but I cannot read it as anything other than is land, so I apologize. Um, but uh, essentially, this isLand component was developed by Zach Leatherman, uh, who is the creator of 11T, most notably. And what this does is it's a component that makes it really easy to be able to control when and how certain components hydrate. So for example, here I've got an isLand component with on interaction. And that basically says if you get any sort of interaction within this element, so that could be a click or a touch um, if you're on a mobile device, um, any kind of interaction within there, then it should trigger hydration of its children. 
And in this case, I've got a deferred comp underneath. That's the same component I used from earlier, but I've got this uh, defer hydration right here. And so it means by default, it's gonna be deferred, nothing happens. But if you click on it, suddenly that will implicitly hydrate. And I, as a developer, don't need to tie these two things together. I don't need my weird like on-click handler. Um, that would be kind of weird and people, the security team would be very unhappy with me. And so Island is able to achieve this for me and just provide that functionality out of the box. So we flip over here and load, you'll notice that it says, click to hydrate and it says, hello world. And as soon as I click on it, that's when it hydrates and switches over to hydroactive. Um, so that's is land that is able to detect that click and then find the child element and just remove defer hydration. So this shows the value of having an interoperable protocol because is land does not have knowledge of hydroactive and hydroactive doesn't have knowledge of is land, but they are both able to interact with each other because they both understand what defer hydration means. And as a result, is land is able to trigger hydration and then hydroactive is able to respond to that uh, and actually hydrate itself accordingly. So we've got this really clean interaction that's happening here because of this common community protocol. And just to show some of how flexible this can be, there's a whole bunch of different functionality that Island provides. This one, for example, says uh, if this media query passes, which essentially says if the max width is under 350 pixels. And so that means that you can hydrate this thing just by narrowing the viewport. And so you'll notice over here, I'm like 400 pixels over here, and it still says hello world down here. Um, and it's when I shrink this thing down and it just crosses that value, suddenly it triggers hydration and updates. And so Island has a bunch of uh, different conditions for this. I definitely recommend you check it out. But it's just one of those ways of like, Hydroactive doesn't need to care about when it hydrates because it just controls defer hydration. And it's up to you as a user to decide when and how you want to make that happen. Um, so you can use Island to do that. You can use any other utility you want. If you want some super custom logic for this, you can make your own component that does that. Uh, and then just find whatever child components it has and remove defer hydration when you want. Uh, and that makes things really powerful. In fact, you could even do that with Hydroactive itself, right? You could have some logic in here which then triggers, uh, you know, query some child and dot hydrate, right? You could put this in an event listener and do that whenever you want to. Um, so it gives you full power for uh, how and when you want to trigger hydration and how you want to make that work. So with that, we're at the end of the video, but uh, I hope this was interesting for you. I hope you learned a little bit about hydration or maybe thought about it a little bit more critically than you have in the past. Um, everything I've just shown is available on the current version of Hydroactive, so I definitely recommend that you check it out. So with that, you know, like, comment, subscribe, all the typical YouTuber stuff. I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, do let me know what you think about the sort of like the breakdown that I had of comp.live into query, hydrate, and enhance. What do you think about that? Is that a reasonable way of thinking about this? What about the actual definition of hydration? Is this a reasonable way of explaining that? Um, are there other little nitpicks that you'd make with that definition? How would you change it? What do you think hydration means to you? As well as, is this just a good way of Hydroactive to tackle these kinds of problems? Uh, is this a good way of tackling the file ordering problem of having some good utilities to be able to trigger hydration if and when you want to? Um, I've got some more ideas coming up in the future about sort of like, can we pass in parameters to hydration? Can we return values from hydration? Uh, I'll leave those just as teasers for the next video, but I've got some interesting ideas in the works there. But with that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.